Good evening and welcome to everyone to our worship service tonight uh, on this rainy night. Good that we're getting rain. And we'd like to welcome everybody and uh, we especially want to welcome any visitors that we may have with us tonight. I invite you to uh, be with us again. Uh, if you are visiting with us, you'll find a card on the seat in front of you and uh, fill that card in and just leave it on the seat there and you'll be shown the location. Uh, 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 well, and it'll be collected later. And uh, if you're watching on Facebook, we ask you to hit the like button so we, so we know that you're with us. If you have a cell phone, please silence it. And let's see, we have a nursery and training room. If you go to the rear of the auditorium, you'll be shown uh, that location for a nursery and training room. We have a few that we need to be remembering in our prayers. So it's on our prayer list. Uh, Ralph Hugart is recovering from a spine procedure last, uh, last Friday. And Galen and Nicole Williams and their family are heading toward New York. I think they're there now. And we will be thinking of them as a, they're away from us. Deidre Jones is traveling to Tennessee and Illinois for an aunt and a cousin funeral. We'll be thinking about Deidre as she travels. Alexis Gaither, who was diagnosed with tremors, and she's being started on some medication here to treat that. She's due to see an endocrinologist on Wednesday and a neurologist on May 9th. So let's be with uh, uh, Alexis as she goes through these uh, procedures. Michael Rogers is scheduled to deploy to Poland uh, this week. Other announcements? Oh, any other announcements on sick or injured or, any, or any, anything that I need to bring up to everybody? Other announcements? Family bowling this Saturday at 12 noon, and that'll be at the um, Hallmark Lanes. Ladies movie night. There'll be ladies movie night this coming Friday here at the building. And uh, ladies, bring your uh, lawn chairs for comfort. And details of the movie are posted on the ladies' uh, bulletin board in the hallway. Men's work day at the campground. There'll be a men's work day at the campground on March 30th at 8 a.m. Uh, please come and, and help with that adventure and bring your work gloves to help with uh, the uh, men's work day at, at the uh, campground. Senior prom alternative. This year we're planning a prom alternative activity for the upperclassmen in high school. On the activity log or transportation, dinner, pictures, and an activity uh, that night. If you're planning on attending, or if you'd like to donate to this activity, uh, please see Phil McIntosh. Ladies retreat at the campground. There'll be a our annual ladies retreat at the Nolanville campgrounds on Saturday, April 30th, beginning at 9.30 a.m. The sign-up sheets uh, on the bulletin board, the ladies bulletin board in the, in the foyer. The Cherokee Home Drive are collecting uh, soup items, canned soup items uh, for Cherokee Home for Children through April 28th. Looking for a uh, cream of mushroom, cream of chicken, cream of celery, uh, cheddar cheese soup, and tomato soup. Please play, uh, post those items, uh, place those items in the uh, foyer in the box that you'll see out there. Tonight, those who are serving in our services, uh, uh, Zach Pettis has a first prayer. Don Maldonado is our song leader. And I see we've got Diego down here, and that's, uh, that's Johnny. Johnny will have the script reading, our sermon by Bill McIntosh, communion offering by Jonathan Smith, and Xavier Estevillo. Closing prayer is Patrick Sellers. Now let's begin our worship service.
Let us focus. Let us concentrate. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this evening to be thankful again that we are able to assemble ourselves together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're truly grateful and we are truly thankful that we didn't allow anything to supersede of our gathering together. This is your day. We pray, Father, that we always respect and honor. This is your day. We pray, Father, for those that have a different way of thinking. And pray, Father, that they have come to the understanding and the respect and to honor and reverence you. That this is a day that you have made we rejoice and we be glad in it. And we pray, Father, that our motives and our way of thinking is correct and right with thee. That we didn't come here for no other reason but to work out our soul's salvation with fear and trembling. To be grateful and thankful, Father, for our, any friends, our guests, that is assembled with us, that we treat them and with respect and with love. But we pray that we show ourselves approved as a congregation, how we ought to behave ourselves in your presence. To continue to pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters that are sick among us, those that are conflicted with illnesses and unable to assemble themselves with us. And those that may be nursing homes and even those that may be traveling. We pray, Father, for those that may be military affiliated. And we pray, Father, for those that may be on business trip as well. But we pray now, Father, that as we come together, that we do all things decently and in order. And that we don't do anything, Father, that is strange and foreign before your sight. We pray, Father, for Brother Phil and the lesson that he present to us, that you guide him and direct him, Father. And we as members and a body listen attentively to the things that he says and we search the scripture to ensure those things are so. We pray now, Father, that as we have assembled ourselves, that we have prepared ourselves and we are ready to hear your word, that your word guide us, direct us, protect us, and, be, and that we be obedient unto your word. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. And we ask you, Father, in our son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Good evening. For our first song, we'll be singing 203, Soldiers of Christ Arise. 203. We'll sing all five verses of the song. And once again, I request that if you're willing and able, please stand for this opening song. 203. If you have it, let us sing. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. 
standing in his great might with all his strength and do but take to warm you for the Take to warm you for the fight, the path, O plea of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, every to buy the whole that having all things done and all your conflicts back you may come through Christ alone you may come through Christ alone and stand Entire at last. Good evening. I'll be reading from Second Timothy chapter two, verses fifteen through sixteen, the King James Version. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth, needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Please mark your songbook to 348, Jesus is tender calling. That is the song of invitation, 348. And our song before the lesson will be, is my hope is built on nothing less, 138. 138. We'll sing the first, excuse me, first and fourth verse of that song. <clears throat> if you have it, let us sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be proud. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the fallen rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Got everybody too tired, sleepy. Go home and have lunch. Come back. Fall asleep during the sermon. I hope you don't. But if you do, you wouldn't be the first. I want to ask you about a word tonight. And I'd like for you to think about the first thing that, that comes to your mind whenever you, you hear that word. If someone were to mention the word practice, what are some things that could come to mind? Now, as far as my mind, most of you know some of the things that I enjoy in my life. One of the things that comes to my mind first is sports. I think about various sports practices that take place. Growing up, I've had basketball practice, baseball practice. I've had a brief experience with football practice. And I know that this particular body in front of you this evening may not look like it, but I used to have soccer practice. And I used to have a lot of soccer practice. 
actually of all of the sports that I ever played growing up, I played soccer the most. I played soccer for almost 10 years. And I always, always enjoyed soccer. I always enjoyed a variety of sports. But if you never practice, you never get any better. Maybe you think of practice and you think of an instrument. I've tried to learn a little bit from time to time. I tried to learn a little bit on a piano years and years ago, and I just never could. Uh, I never could pick any of that talent up. Maybe I just wasn't born uh, with that particular talent. Maybe my mind and my hand just can't do things like that at the same time. Although I am able to walk and chew gum, it, that, might be, that might be the end of it. Maybe that's all of the, the multi-talented things I can do at one time. But there are some people who are very gifted with instruments. There are some who pick these things up very naturally. Others might have to work at it. Others might have to practice. Whether you are in the, the school band or uh, something that you enjoy doing for fun or for leisure, maybe music is what comes to mind when you hear practice. Maybe you think about a teenager, as I mentioned some of that this morning, who needs to learn how to drive better. You know, I know that this might be a shock to some people who are 16, 17, and 18, but you are not the best driver the world has ever seen. I guarantee you there are things you can do better. I guarantee you that there are things you will notice and learn throughout the years. And while you may look at that 80-year-old woman in the car in front of you and assume she doesn't know what she's doing and what she's even doing on the road, well, there's people behind you saying the same thing. I wonder if under a certain age, we should, all, we should mandate people wear those, those yellow stickers on the back of the car that say student driver. I, I heard somebody at our homeschool camp this past week talking about a great difficulty that they had with their kids, and that was teaching them how to reverse. I'm not going to stand on a soapbox. That's not the point of the lesson tonight. But it is an itty-bitty tiny soapbox for five seconds, if you don't mind. The review, rear view cameras that we have in our cars today, I think they do damage to new drivers. We get so used to seeing these things, and I try to tell my sons, you don't need that camera to back up. Use your mirrors. I see Johnny looking over at Jonathan. Apparently, I'm not the only one who's ever told a kid that. Use your mirrors. We train our children to drive, and we certainly want them to be safe, and so we, we want them to practice at their driving. Maybe we think about the word in a whole different vein. Maybe you think about a, a doctor or a lawyer. They have a practice, right? The word might not be used the same, but it is certainly the same word. Well, I'd like us to think about the word practice tonight as it applies to spiritual life. I'd like to think of practice tonight not as something we own, not as something that we operate, but something in which we willfully joyfully, and frequently engage. I was doing some door knocking, not asking for Bible studies as much as it was just informing people of a, I believe it was a gospel meeting uh, that the congregation was, was offering at that time. And we're going around from house to house, and sometimes we'll have good receptions from people that open the door, and sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll have people that are happy to see you. Sometimes you have people that may act uh, friendly, but they're waiting for you to leave. And sometimes you might have some people who are very blunt and who are very rude, and they wish you had never bothered them and that day at all. Well, I knocked on the door of this one family, and they came to the door, and they talked for just a minute. We told them where we were from. We said, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm from uh, the, the Church of Christ. We used the name of the congregation where we were worshiping at the time. And they said that they were a member of a particular religious organization that has, they didn't say this, but I'm telling you this, that has influenced how we use the word practice. Because not only did this person say they were Catholic, they said they were a certain type of practicing Catholic. I don't know if any other religious organization in the world has really impacted how we view that term. Somebody is either a practicing Catholic or a non-practicing Catholic. What does it mean? Well, they either consider themselves a part of that church and they go on maybe Easter and Christmas, that's a non-practicing, or they are a practicing member of that religion and they are very active in their church. Now, that same word is not a word that we use. That's not something that we would, uh, would utter in our explanation of who we are. But the same kind of idea exists, does it not? If we are to say that sister or brother so-and-so is a faithful member of the Lord's church here at Colleen, what do we mean by that? 
They are doctrinally pure. They are active in the worship services. They are generally here every time the door is open, and they are willing participants in the worship service. We have members. They don't call themselves that, and we might not call them that. But the Lord's church has members who are practicing members of the church and non-practicing members of the church. There are those who call themselves a Christian, who are active, who are engaged, who are here, who are attempting to grow and to mature. And then we have members that wear the name, but do very little associated with the name. Which one would you be? If you were to be described by God, by the Lord our judge, would he consider you a practicing member of his church or not? Let me look very quickly at a definition that we can find from Merriam-Webster. And then I want us to take these definitions. I want to go to God's Word, and I want to see what we can learn from a specific encounter with one of the congregations of the Lord's Church that we read of in our Bibles. Here's four definitions of the word practice. Now, I want you to, to think about these, but I want you to specifically think about these as they apply to our primary topic this evening, and that is a practicing form of religion. Now, you can apply this to sports. You can apply this to music. You can apply this to being a better cook. You can apply it to anything you'd like. But let's specifically apply these definitions to how might this fit in to the understanding that we're trying to gain of what God wants from us as we look at these definitions and then go to the Bible. The word practice means to do or perform often. Number two, it means to perform or work repeatedly so as to become proficient. Now in the text that Gianni read just a minute ago from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, isn't there some idea underlaid there in 2 Timothy 2, 15 of being proficient? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Some translations say handling the word of God aright. That same idea of proficiency is noted by the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12, 13, and 14, when he says, for them for the time you ought to be teachers, you have someone need you teach. Essentially, he means the basics all over again. He says, they have become to need milk and not strong meat. Strong meat, he says, are available to those who, by reason of use, have exercised their senses. That's someone who is practicing to become proficient. That's someone who is maturing frequently in order to become spiritually proficient. Number three, to pursue a profession actively. Number four, the fourth definition of practice, the condition of being proficient through systematic exercise. Now these can apply to a variety of veins of our life. But these four things can also specifically apply to how we live our lives as Christians. How often do we engage ourselves with God's Word? And how often do we engage God's Word in our relationship with others? Has anybody here ever stopped doing something for a while and then got back to it and realized you were a little bit rusty? Realized you just hadn't really done it in a while? Has anybody here ever been forced by their parents or their grandparents to learn how to drive a manual transmission vehicle, but if you got in one right now, you wouldn't be able to move it? Maybe. Some things might stay ingrained in our mind. They say that you don't forget how to ride a bike. Well, don't ride one for 20, 30 years and see what happens. When you don't do something often, you lose something. That is even heightened to a phenomenal standard if we're talking about spiritual activities. You may know what Genesis 1-1 says. You may know what Acts 2-38 says. You may know the entirety of Psalm 23. And you may be able to quote John chapter 3 and verse 16. But if you don't quote those scriptures frequently, guess what happens to them? They fall out of your head. If you don't search your Bible frequently, then the next time somebody asks you to turn to the book of Hosea or Amos, it might take you a while to do so. You might even have to go to the beginning of your Bible and find where those books are. The idea of practice is heightened even more phenomenally when it applies to whether or not we are actively 
and frequently engaged with God's Word and the application of God's Word in the way that we live our lives. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles as we begin our points this evening to the book of Revelation and chapter number 3. Revelation chapter number 3. We're going to talk about the problem first. Though the Bible teaches us that the Lord has one church, it's very plain when Jesus speaks of that one flock and one shepherd in John 10 and verse 16. It's very plain, whatever we see, that there is one body, just as there is one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father in Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible tells us there is one body of Christ, though many different members in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Though there is one body of the Lord's church, there are throughout scattered in this world various congregations just like this one, who wear His name, who operate themselves according to what's in the Scriptures, and who are overseen by elders that also can be pastors, shepherds, overseers, bishops. All of those words in the Bible apply to the office of an elder that we read of in Titus and in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And primarily they are overseen by, just as this congregation is, the Word of God. The Lord's church has no creed or manual or statement of faith that you might find in man-made religions. The Lord's church operates only by what is in the New Testament. But since there are varieties of congregations, since not everyone on the face of the earth can meet at one point on the same day at the same time, it would be a little hard for Christians in Russia and Christians here to meet at the same place, wouldn't it? So you have the Lord's church who is spread throughout. Sometimes you have them in various cities in a county. Sometimes you have multiple congregations even in one city. Well, you find as you open in the book of Revelation, a man by the name of John the beloved apostle of Jesus, the one who quite frequently is spoken of in the Bible as simply the one who Jesus loved. From the information we can gather, John far outlived some of the other apostles. Now, when you look at the very last chapter of the book of John, Jesus is speaking there to Peter, and he tells them about how he's going to die. He explains to him about the death he's going to die to glorify the Lord. And Peter, when he hears this, he, he looks over and he notices John and he tells Jesus, but what about this man? Anybody remember what happens next? Now, this is not where this lesson is going, so I can't stay here long, but I'll camp out all night in John 21 if I could, because Jesus tells Peter there, if I will that he, he is the John, the apostle John, if I will that he remain till I return, what is that to you? You follow me. Essentially, what Jesus then was telling Peter is you worry about Peter's business and I'll worry about John's business. You carry your life. You take care of your responsibility. Well, it is that John who wrote the book of John, also 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and who penned for us the contents of the book of God's revelation. We find out as we begin here in Revelation chapter 1 that he is exiled on the island of Patmos. And while there, he received a revelation from God that he was told to record. He was specifically told that the things that he was being instructed of would shortly come to pass. And he wrote about the dangers that would threaten the church, but also the victory that the church would experience if they stayed with God. In chapter 1, John tells us about the revelation, how he is told to write. He talks about seeing a vision of Jesus at the end of chapter 1. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we have penned by John the words of Jesus to these seven churches in Asia. I'm quite sure these are not the entirety of all of the local congregations of the Lord's church that comprised Asia Minor, but these are the seven that were chosen by God. These are the seven that were chosen by the Lord to give a message. You and I need to be very careful as we read through this section because we may think about the, the church in Ephesus. We may think about the church in Philadelphia. We may think about one of these other churches and say, well, but we're not like them. Well, sometimes that's a, that's a good lesson to have. That's not what we're doing tonight. But that's a good lesson to have. If we were one of the churches in the group of seven churches that Jesus talked to, what would he have to say about us? What good would he have to say about us? What cautions would he have to say about us? What corrections would he have to offer us? In most of these conversations with the seven churches, there is some good and there is some bad. 
I believe there is one church of which nothing negative is said, but then there's one church where nothing positive is said. It's that church that we're going to read about this evening. Not a single positive thing is mentioned about the Lord's church who was gathered in the city of Laodicea. Let's go look at their problem. Revelation chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. You think about how far off the mark how far must a church have fallen for God to say, you are so distasteful to me, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. They say, well, well the God I know would never, don't, don't, don't say that. If you are very adamant, if you are very aggressively confident that you could say, the God I know would never say something like that, then you don't know the God of the Bible. You may have created some other version of God, but that's not the God of the Bible. Because the same God who tells Laodicea that they need to repent in a hurry, quick, fast, and right now, or they will get spewed out of his mouth, is the same God that told his people in the Old Testament, I despise your feast days. The same God of the Old Testament that said, why are you even wasting your time worshiping me? You're not doing it right. I don't accept it. Just go do something else. Now, God didn't tell them that. That's essentially the message that God is giving through his prophet. God said he hated the things that they offered. Their heart wasn't right with God. Their spirit wasn't right with God. Their worship wasn't right with God. Let's not ever say, well, the God that I know wouldn't X, Y, and Z. Because if it's the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible clearly does something, then you don't know that God. Because this God says he expects to be worshipped in a specific way. This God says He expects to be approached in a specific way. This God says He expects to be honored in a specific way. You and I do not have the right to live for God, to worship God, or to talk about God like we want and force God to accept it. God doesn't work that way. We need to have the attitude of a scripture that I've mentioned at least a handful of times. One time recently, I believe it was two Sundays ago I mentioned this verse. Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. When you have done all those things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. We don't tell God how to be our God. He tells us how to be His people. That's the way it's supposed to work. Well, apparently the church in Laodicea wasn't complying with the instructions of how to be His people. We're going through verse 17. Let's look at this. He says, Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. Say, so God, we're doing pretty good. We're on a high hill. Everything in life is great. Everything's coming up roses for us. I don't need anything. And God says, well, except for the fact that you're sick and dying and don't know any better. Look at the second half of the verse. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We could make this into a lesson about congregations of the Lord's church who have left the truth. That's not really our purpose for this evening, but we could make it about that. We could make this scripture a condemnation on us if we ever engage in such arrogance that we're doing everything just as it needs to be done. We have no flaws. We have no faults. We have nothing we can improve on. And somehow we think we're the ones helping God instead of the other way around. God says, you think you're doing great, and really you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What was so wrong with the church in Laodicea? Well, let me ask you this question. What images come to mind, or what feelings come up when you think about something that's lukewarm? Now, for me, I think about coffee. Number one, I think about coffee because I think about coffee a lot. <laughs> Just one of those things that exists in my life. Pretty much seven days a week, I've got some form of coffee. I can have coffee cold, and I can have coffee hot. But there's one thing I can't stand. And that's when I make a pot of coffee, 
And finally, I know that it's filled. I'll go over to my clean cup. I'll pick it up. I'll pour me the first glass and I'll sit down. And I'll do something on the computer or somebody will call with a question or I will somehow otherwise get sidetracked and I come back to that cup and that first cup is not, co is not cold and it's not hot. Guess what I do with that coffee? And no, the answer is I do not heat it up. Microwave coffee is disgusting. You don't, you, you don't reheat coffee and it tastes as good. Once it gets lukewarm, I don't enjoy drinking it. You pour it out and get a hot cup. I'm not going to drink that. It's nasty to me to drink lukewarm coffee. As nasty as lukewarm coffee might be to me, how much more distasteful must a lukewarm church be to God? God says, you're not hot. You're not cold. You're somewhere in the middle. And I can't stand it. Now, God doesn't say I can't stand you because the Lord encourages them to repent. And when the Lord encourages someone to repent, that means He's willing to take them back. He wants them to improve. He wants them to mature. But He's telling them right now, you're on a collision course with disaster and you need to realize it and you need to turn around before it's too late. If you would, go ahead and keep some kind of a bookmark there in Revelation chapter 3 because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Turn to the, the book of Hebrews and chapter number 2. I want to tell you what Laodicea's problem was. What was so bad about the church in Laodicea? What was so bad about the Christians who met there, who called themselves by the name of the Lord, who no doubt met and sang and prayed and offered up their own monies that God had blessed them with, who gathered together in fellowship, who invoked the name of the Father and of the Lord and of the Spirit in their worship, who remembered the Lord and their observance of the Lord's Supper. What was so bad about that church? They were drifting. They were just drifting. They had no drive. They had no desire. They had no fire. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The Hebrews writer says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. How does somebody drift away? You don't drift away if you're practicing. You don't get rusty if you're practicing. You don't stop caring if you're practicing. You drift away when you become unconcerned. You drift away when it no longer becomes a priority for you. Verse 2 says, For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now realize, he's talking about drifting away. So he's writing to people who are already Christians. He's writing to people who have already been saved, who have already been washed by the blood of the Lord in baptism. And yet he tells them if they neglect that salvation, there is danger to come. That means that not only is there danger for those who have not obeyed the gospel, and that is eternal separation from God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 tells us, there is also danger for those who are the Lord's church and drift away. Those who are the Lord's church but become unconcerned. Those who are the Lord's church but lose their fire. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? The church in Laodicea had no love like most of the other churches mentioned for God. They had no faith for which Jesus could commend them. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seeking God is not something the Laodicean church was doing. Apparently, they weren't diligently doing anything. They had become cavalier in their attitude toward God. They had become lax in their attitude toward their Christianity. They had simply stopped practicing their Christianity. I want to give a little bit of a, a deeper understanding, perhaps, to, to what it is that we're discussing here. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through the end, talks about Laodicea being lukewarm. Let me mention five other words for you that can perhaps be a, a synonym of lukewarm. And maybe we can think about this in relation to, to us, or maybe to, to other people that we're concerned about, their souls. Five synonyms here of lukewarm that might help us to explain what was wrong at Laodicea. 
and help us to actively pursue improvement upon in ourselves so these five synonyms don't come to us. Number one, the first synonym is apathetic. The second is disenchanted. Somebody who stops appreciating the lengths God has gone for them and they no longer use that appreciation in their life for God. Number three, somebody has become indifferent. They can take God, they can leave God. They can take church, they can leave church. They can take Bible study, they can leave Bible study. Number four, somebody who has become uninterested. That's the the kind of person that might get up on a Sunday morning and ask their spouse, do you want to go to church today? If someone in their home is practicing their responsibility to God, if they are practicing their devotion to God, if they are practicing their Christianity, the question of do you want to go to church should never come up in that house. It is simply an understood. It is where God desires us to be on Sunday, and it is where, because of our love for God, we desire to be. But somebody who's lukewarm is somebody who has become uninterested. Number five, the last synonym. Somebody who is lukewarm is somebody who has become unexcited. Sometimes you have individuals who, as they are new converts, they are absolutely on fire and they want to save the entire world. But over the course of months or years, something might happen in their life and they might get frustrated, they might get discouraged, they might get taken advantage of by the devil or those who are working for his cause. Maybe their, their efforts are not quite appreciated. Maybe their, their energies are tamped down a little by somebody else. Maybe somebody says something as a, a critique to them trying to help them and they take it the wrong way. Regardless, sometimes you have somebody that's absolutely, you've heard the phrase, somebody who is on fire for the Lord and then you turn around the next time you see them and that fire is just not there anymore. Somebody who is lukewarm is somebody who has become unexcited. That was the problem at Laodicea. They had no fire. They had no zeal for God. They had no energy for God. Their faith was present in name, but not action. James chapter 2 and verse 26 tells us, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know what happens if you say you have faith, but you don't practice that faith through works? Number one, the Bible says that faith is not alive. That faith is certainly not helping anybody else. That faith is not helping you. But something else happens is you might become, if you don't practice your faith, you might become unexcited. You might become disinterested. You might simply become apathetic. So there's the problem. Let's talk about the prescription. What, what could they do to, to fix it? Turn with me to the book of John. John's gospel account in chapter number 9. Most of us know what the word prescription means, right? Most of us have taken or maybe currently take some kind of prescription medication. Why do we have prescription medication? Because we've got a problem and because a doctor has assessed our problem and has prescribed us medicine to address that problem in order to reverse the effects or at least to arrest the effects, maybe to completely solve the problem that exists. When you and I don't feel well, we go to the doctor's office. We hope that we can be told what's wrong. Now, that might take us a while, depending on the severity of our case. Sometimes doctors don't always know what's wrong with us, but for many things, for most things, you go to the doctor when you're sick, the doctor tells you what's wrong. You don't know if you have strep throat. You don't know if you have flu. You don't know if you have COVID. You don't know if you have RSV. Well, they've got tests. They can figure that out. They can find out what's wrong with you and give you the specific medicine that is necessary to fix that problem. Here's the problem with Laodicea. It's hard to get the medicine that you need when you're sick if you don't realize that you're sick. If you think, well, everything's great with me. I don't have any problems. I don't feel bad. My eyes are good. My breath is good. My lungs are clear. I've got all the energy I need. I'm not sick. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 17, Jesus talked about the individuals that he was looking for. Now in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that God wants everybody. 
He desires that all will come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants everybody to be saved. But in Mark 2, 17, Jesus talks about a specific type of person he was looking for. He said, the well have no need of a physician, but those that are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus said he's looking for people who know they have a problem because the great physician can't heal the problem of those who won't admit they have a problem. The great physician can't heal the lives of those who won't admit they've got faults. The great physician can't heal the sickness of somebody who doesn't know and doesn't care and doesn't want to hear that they might be sick. But the people who are sick, the people who are struggling, the people who do have a problem in life, they go look for that solution. Jesus wants those people because he's got that solution, because he is that great physician. Look at John chapter 9 and turn with me to John 39. Look at verse 39. And Jesus says, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remains. They were not open to the possibility that they had spiritual problems. And so because they were not open to the possibility of spiritual sickness, they weren't open to the message of Jesus. They weren't the kind of people that Jesus was going to heal because they wouldn't admit they even had a problem that needed it. The church in Laodicea assumed they were healthy when in reality they had pieces of their body falling apart all around them and laying on the floor. When they were told that they were lukewarm, that should have meant something to them. When they received this message from John, they should have been shocked to hear that God called them lukewarm. We won't spend too much time doing this, but there is something geographically interesting about the church in Laodicea. And that was, though they were an incredibly rich city, we'll talk about exactly how rich they were in just a minute, but though they were an incredibly rich city, they had limited natural resources. They did not have their own source of water there in their specific city. They had to have hot water piped in from one city and cold water piped in from another city. Guess what temperature that water would be when it arrived in Laodicea? It'd be lukewarm. They should have known what that meant. They should have been shocked to hear that they were called lukewarm, neither whole nor, nor cold nor hot. Jesus sends them these words to let them know that they're sick and what they've got. Sometimes knowing that something is wrong is just as important as knowing what is wrong. Now you say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If I know that something's wrong, but I don't get any help for it, that doesn't really do me any good. It does, though, if the person would admit there's a problem. If the individual is so blinded, ignorant, or arrogant to know that they even have a problem, then knowing that they have a problem, acknowledging that there is a problem, is just as important to them, or perhaps more so, than finding out the solution to the problem. Because if they don't know that they're sick, they can't possibly find the remedy for it. If somebody refuses to admit that they're spiritually sick, God cannot save that person. God wants them saved, God has offered the blood of His Son to save them, but God can't make them. God will not make them accept that truth and accept that invitation. God will not force them into the baptistry. Sometimes knowing that we have a problem is just as important as knowing what our problem is. So here's what they were. They were, using our words that we have in Revelation chapter 3, they were wretched. He said, you think, we're, you think you're great, but really... What are you? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So they were wretched. That word can mean beaten down and possessing calluses. Word study says that can be defined as severe side effects from ongoing strain. They were miserable. That word can mean in great need of mercy or desperate. They were poor. The word poor is interesting there in Revelation 3 because it comes from a word that means to crouch like a beggar. Word study says that this word refers to the pauper rather than just the average peasant, meaning it is the absolute extreme opposite of the rich. They were blind. 
What's interesting is this word blind was not only used by biblical, biblical writers, but this word blind was also used by secular writers. And even secular authors use that word for someone being mentally blind. And lastly, they were naked. This one's pretty easy to understand, is it not? They were without proper clothing. But the word can also mean laid bare. They simply do not have the things that they need. Let's go ahead and turn back over there. Let's read a couple more verses. Revelation chapter 3. The Lord's church at Laodicea was told in no uncertain terms they were struggling, they were failing, they were lost at sea, and they didn't even know it. They were then told again in terms they could understand that their faith and their energy was in the wrong place. Look at verses 18 and 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. They lacked that zeal. They lacked that fire. They were simply drifting along and going through the motions. They weren't interested in God. They weren't on fire for God. They had no energy for God. And yet Jesus still says, I love you and I want you to come back. They still had the opportunity to return. They just had to have the willingness. They needed to be told something was wrong. So there's four things that we find here in verses 18 and 19. Number one, he tells them to buy gold. Now, if you knew anything about the city of Laodicea, buying gold might be a little bit strange for that church to hear because the city of Laodicea was incredibly rich. And I don't mean that they had some people who on one side of the tracks had some houses you really don't want to spend some time on, but the other side of the tracks over by the country club and the lakes, they had the really nice houses with three-car garages and six bedrooms and 17 bathrooms. That's not the kind of thing we're talking about. We're talking about a city who was so rich as a whole that in A.D. 60 there was an earthquake that destroyed much of the city. Rome volunteered to give them money to assist them to rebuild, and the Laodicean city said, no thanks, we've got enough money to fix it ourselves. They denied government assistance to rebuild this. Can you imagine a Detroit, a Los Angeles, a Houston, a Dallas? Can you imagine any of these great cities in our country if something happened and they had such a terrible thing happen there and the government says, look, we're going to give you all this money to fix it. The city says, no thanks, we're good. We'll fix it ourselves. We don't need your money. Every time there's any even hint of a natural disaster, what do you have from mayors, from uh, congressmen, from representatives, from governors, asking the government to, to mandate this is some kind of a catastrophe, some kind of an emergency event, and to release funds. The city of Laodicea was so rich that an earthquake devastated their city, and they rebuilt it themselves, telling Rome, no, we don't need that kind of money. The city of Laodicea was also known to be to house a banking center there. So Jesus tells them to buy gold. Jesus is talking to a church that exists in a city that is incredibly rich. Why is he telling us to buy gold? We have all the gold we need. Well, you have worldly gold, but you're not interested in God's gold. You're not interested in the Lord's gold. He tells them to receive white garments. The Laodiceans were also known for their wool production and for their exports. He tells them to anoint their eyes with salve. There was some type of a, a medical center. I don't know if it was a medical university necessarily, but some type of a medical center that existed there in Laodicea. And there was a powder that was one of, I believe, the exports of that city that was used to make a salve for eyes. These three things are not just random things that the Lord chose. Buying gold, receiving white garments, anointing your eyes with salve. They all were spiritual messages based on physical things that existed within that city. Jesus says, you think you've got it all under control, but in reality, spiritually, you don't have gold, you don't have garments, you don't have medicine. Spiritually, you're bankrupt. Spiritually, you're not rich. Spiritually, you're not well. So repent. Come back. Turn around. Stop going that direction. So there was the prescription for them. But you know what? If you don't ever get the disease to begin with, you don't need the prescription. 
You need the prevention. What can I do to make sure that doesn't happen? You know, there are certain things in our life that we can try to remedy. Certain people finally have a, a measure of their health that, that, that tilts on the scales and finally goes over the line and somebody says, okay, well, now you've gone past the line, now you're a diabetic. Well, there are treatments and there are changes of life that an individual can involve themselves in to get those numbers back on this side and no longer be a diabetic. But there's also people who can take charge of their life well before they get to that point and they can prevent themselves from ever becoming diabetic from taking care of their health. That's just one example out of an example of probably hundreds that we could imagine. We can prevent certain things by the way that we live our lives. Well, you and I can prevent being the church at Laodicea by how we live our lives. We can prevent from being lukewarm Christians from how we live our lives. Number one, we need to understand that the devil is there and that he's not going anywhere. Oh, he will eventually. Eventually, the Bible says he'll be thrown away. He'll be thrown into the depths of hell and it's no longer going to be a problem for you and me. The last... The middle, middle section of Scripture in Revelation chapter 20 explains that to us. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, I believe, the very last verse of that chapter says nothing is going to be allowed in heaven that defiles. We won't have to worry about the devil there. But while we're here, we do. There's a couple of Scriptures that we need to be aware of that we need to, to constantly remind ourselves of. One of them is Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. All these people are gathering themselves before God and the devil was also present. God asked him the question, what are you doing? Where have you come from? What's been going on? What does he say? He had been roaming to and fro on the face of the earth. What could he possibly have been doing? 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 8 tells us what he was doing. He was prowling, looking for some weak, looking for some sickly, looking for some small, uninterested party that he can destroy. John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus says that the devil is a liar, but he also says the devil is a murderer. If the devil can tear your soul into multiple pieces, he will. If you give him the opportunity, he will absolutely take that foothold you give him into your life. You start becoming lukewarm, apathetic, uninterested, lack of energy for God, the devil's going to take advantage of that. And he's going to try to push you away from God even further. When we are lukewarm, all we're doing is opening the door and inviting the lion inside. 1 Peter 5 and 8 categorizes him as a ravenous lion bent on doing disaster to those he can grab with his paws and with his teeth. When you and I are lukewarm, when we're apathetic, when we're unengaged, when we're disinterested for God and His church and His Word, we're inviting that lion in. I wrote this, this line because these two words start with the same letter. Maybe it can stick in our minds. When we have apathy, we give Him access. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, we are not ignorant of his devices. We need to not be ignorant of this device. When we have apathy, we give the devil access. So how do you prevent lukewarm souls of an individual? Lukewarm souls of a family? Lukewarm souls of a congregation? Two words, knowledge and zeal. Those are great weapons that we have that come directly from God's Word and the inspiration of God's Word through His Holy Spirit that can provide for us two wonderful weapons against apathy, against lukewarmness, knowledge and zeal. The more of each of those things we pursue, the more of the other we'll gain. You can't gain all you can know without being mutually benefited by both even more strongly. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. I want you to read just a couple of verses with me and we're done for this evening. Look at 1 John chapter 2. Let's use some other scriptures in the Bible and see what Jesus was telling the church at Laodicea they needed to be. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. You may know these verses well. 
John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Let's go back to an Old Testament reference. In fact, these last two are both from Old Testament, but they paint a wonderful picture for us. Turn back to the book of 2 Kings and go to chapter 23. 2 Kings 23. And we find here some activity in the life of King Josiah. 2 Kings 23, verses 24 and 25 say, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and of Jerusalem, that, there's a purpose, why did he do it? That he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. How come there was nobody like him before or after? He removed all of those things that provide illness and willfully engaged in those things that provided health. He got rid of the negative things for the specific purpose of performing the words of the law. He had an interest not only in God, but in God's word. And he had an interest in carrying out God's word. If we are lukewarm, we've stopped worrying about God's word. If we're lukewarm, we have stopped worrying about carrying out God's word. If we are lukewarm, we have stopped doing what? Practicing our love, dedication, and obedience to God. The last verse is in the book of Jeremiah. Open to Jeremiah chapter 20. This is the opposite of lukewarm. The opposite of a cavalier attitude. The opposite of apathy, laziness, and weakness. Now Jeremiah ran into some problems. Jeremiah's own hometown warned him that he better leave or they were going to kill him. Jeremiah perhaps had one of the more disappointing ministries of all of God's prophets of the Old Testament. There was perhaps very few, if any, that ever listened to what Jeremiah had to say. So much so that Jeremiah was overcome with frustration. He kept butting his head against a wall and nothing was happening. So look what he says. Verse 9, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. We need to grow a zeal for God, and a fire for God, and an energy for God and his word in our not only in our congregation, but in our specific souls. It's easy to say, oh, we've got faithful elders. It's easy to say, oh, we've got active members. It's easy to say, oh, we've got some wonderful Bible class teachers. But you know what? You're, you're not going to be judged by how good the rest of the church is. You're not going to be judged by how active the rest of the congregation is. You're not going to be judged by how good your elders are. You're going to be judged by whether or not you practiced the law. You're going to be judged by whether or not you practiced love. We're going to be judged by the things that we have done. We need to live our lives in such a way that we take in God's word as often as possible. And if it doesn't yet exist, we cultivate that fire that Jeremiah wrote about. That God is inside of us so deeply and so permanently that there is no way any water in this world could ever extinguish that flame. The devil might pour as much water on it as he can, but the Word of God has the potential to create a fire in us that he cannot put out. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. 
Does that define your relationship with God? Does that define your outlook? Would God look down and see that you are cavalier in your attitude toward, toward your Christianity? Would God look down and see that you were apathetic, disinterested, drifting away from zeal and energy and doctrinal purity? Or would God see a fire? Would God see a willingness? Would God see a zeal? We need to be awake. And we need to be aware. The church of Laodicea was dying and didn't even know it. Let that never be said by God of us. Let it never be said that we are dying and don't know it. Let it never be said that we are spiritually weak and not concerned about it. You know, the building this evening is not as full as it was this morning. And you know that happens every single Sunday. The building on Wednesday night might not be as full as it is tonight. You know how often that happens? Every single Wednesday. How is it that the building is not as full on a Wednesday night as it is on a Sunday morning? I don't begin to know the thoughts or the hearts of anybody. But I do know that there is value in practicing our obedience to God's instruction. There is value in practicing our obedience in reading God's Word. There is value in practicing our study of God's Word. And there is absolutely value in practicing faithful attendance with the rest of the church. We know that that was a problem even from the first century, even from when the church was just a baby. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 said there were already people who started to drift off. There were already people who no longer were faithful in their attendance. Those people are headed toward lukewarmness. Those people are headed toward apathy. Those people are headed toward a disinterested, unenergetic life for God. Let's never be Christians in name only. Let it not be said by God that we are not practicing Christians. Let it not be said by God that we are not practicing children of His. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Showing your love to the Lord. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, call yourself by my name. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, make sure you're dressed up in a nice suit or dress on Sunday morning and then spend the rest of the week doing what you want. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, make sure my name's on the outside of the building, but go the rest of your way. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know how many of those you and I get to pick and choose which one we follow? None if we want to be with Him. Let's live our lives in such a way that we are obedient to the Lord, that we know His Word, and that we are willfully, joyfully practicing the life He's called us to live. Let's ensure that our congregation is never like the church at Laodicea. The Lord has given us each an invitation to be a part of His family, to have the peace and the love, to enjoy the mercy and the grace of God through our obedience to the gospel. He's given us the steps in the Bible that tell us it's exactly how we can find ourselves in a perfect relationship with our God. He invites us to hear His Word and to believe it to repent of our sins, turning away from our former life and turning toward God, telling Him we'll do what He wants us to do from now on. God invites us to confess the identity of Jesus, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Savior. And God invites us and instructs us and commands us to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, coming up out of that water to start a brand new life with Him, a life in which we practice our love a life in which we practice our obedience, a life in which we practice our dedication for Him. If you've not done that this evening, don't wait until it's too late. If you don't have a full picture of exactly what it is that God wants from you and you'd like to know, then let somebody know and we'll begin a Bible study with you. If you have already done that tonight, but your practice has fallen short, your dedication has started to cool off, your zeal has started to be turned down, Whatever the need may be, if the Lord's church can help you this evening. 
if the rest of the Christians surrounding you tonight can assist you if you're already a member and you have some need, or if you're not a member and you have a need, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. Sign of love, wilt thou roam farther and farther away? Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today. Bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away, calling today, calling to him. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is waiting, oh come to him now. Waiting today, waiting today. Come with thy sins at his feet, lowly bow. Come and no longer delay. Come. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is pleading, oh, listen to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe on his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and awake. Calling to him, calling to him. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling to him. Before we continue, does anybody need to partake the Lord's Supper that did not this morning? Please be seated. Please raise your hand if you need the packet. If you do not receive the communion packet, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. For our song, we will be singing 393, True Worship. We'll sing all three verses of that song. If you have it, let us sing. Off we come together. Off we sing and pray. Here we bring our Lord, thy love to 
On the first day of the week, we partake in the Lord's Supper to remember Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice. Will you bow with me? Father who art thou in heaven, we come before you as we are about to take this bread, which is your son's body, which was beaten, humiliated, and whipped on the cross to remember and thank you for his sacrifice. You sent down your only son, and he came down willingly to sacrifice himself, endure all this pain for us, to put his body through all this torment in order to provide us with the opportunity to spend eternity with you. And this we are forever thankful. And we pray that we are able to do all things in accordance with your will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you bow with me again? Father, who art thou in heaven, we come before you about to take this cup, which is your son's blood, which was shed on the cross for the remissions of our sins, to thank you for your love and to thank you for wanting to save us, us who are sinful people who do not deserve the sacrifice of your perfect son, your holy son, your son who did no wrong, but was willing to die on the cross for our sins. Now we have an opportunity to uphold your standards, to uphold your holy light, and to become gracious servants in your kingdom. We are for th forever thankful for this opportunity that you have provided us. And we pray that we are able to continue to practice and uphold all standards within your kingdom. We pray all these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a portion of our service where we take the time to give back after we have been given so much. I will be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I mean chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, but for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all its sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Will you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you with our hearts filled with joy, love, and gratitude, because we are so grateful for all of the abundance of blessings and opportunities that you have bestowed upon us. Whether those things be cars, money, clothes, or... Uh, jobs, careers, or the opportunity to spend eternal paradise with you. Father, please help us to have more of a selfish attitude and mindset when it comes to giving. Please help us to be, to want to be 
a cheerful giver, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are willing to give, the job box will be in the foyer on your way out. If you are willing and able, please stand for the closing song and closing prayer. Once again, we are so grateful to the guests and members who were able to come tonight. We pray that you will be able to make it again. For our final song, we will be singing Hallelujah, Praise Your Hope, number seven. Number seven. We'll be singing all three verses of the song as well. If you have it, let us sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah from the heavens praise his name praise jehovah in the highest all his angels praise proclaim all his hosts together praise him sun and moon and stars on high praise him all ye heaven above the sky. Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established his decree shall ever stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah, all ye floods, ye dragons, all, fire and hell and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praises give Jehovah, for his name alone is I, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Are you fruit? trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, things of earth and all ye people, princes, great earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let us bow. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. 
Lord, thank you for Lord for next we have come to today to assemble to you and worship you, Lord. Lord, help us all come home safe, you Lord. Help those people who are bound to help homes, Lord. Please, Lord, don't, please help them back to good health, Lord. Lord, please guide, guide doctors' hands that they perform surgery, Lord. Lord, be with the president, be given wisdom, and make the right decisions, Lord. Lord, please guide us in the race, Lord. These are actually in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.